Hi, in this video we're going to talk about the atmosphere, specifically the atmosphere and how it relates to aircraft and aerospace. Thanks so much to Project Lead the Way for providing a lot of this material. So this is probably review for a lot of us, but the Earth's atmosphere is made up of air, of which most of it is nitrogen, uh, and then the second component is oxygen. It has a lot other things as well. Argon, uh, we all know the ozone layer, we've heard of that. And uh, what does it do is it, it protects us, uh, it gives us oxygen to breathe, and it does a, a host of other things. One thing that's kind of interesting here is the fact that um, it goes up to 60 miles, and that's really sort of an arbitrary number. Uh, there is air above 60 miles, and there's air below 60 miles. 60 miles is a little bit of an arbitrary number. Some people would even put it lower. But think about that for a second uh, to put that in context, and that's what's kind of important here. 60 miles with respect to the scale of the earth that's kind of like having uh, a basketball with saran wrap or a piece of paper around it it's actually very very thin so let's take a closer look at that first 60 miles and what that looks like so here's a graphic that shows actually up to 75 miles I chose a little bit different graphic because I thought it uh, it did a pretty good job. But it shows the different layers of the atmosphere. So down at the bottom, <clears throat> we see the troposphere. And then it goes to the stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere up at the top. And then between those, there's a little layer that separates the two. And generally between there, there's not much change in temperature or pressure. Airplanes spend most of their time in the troposphere, which is near the bottom, and you might see really high performance or research aircraft up in the, you know, maybe the 12, 13 mile range. You generally don't see them up above that. So if we take a look at what's happening in the troposphere, uh, on the left hand side with the, the yellow lines we see temperature and the troposphere is pretty linear. The temperature drops or gets lower, decreases as you increase in altitude. And then on the right hand side we can see the pressure. This is in millibars, so that's a, a a metric equivalent. We'll talk about that in a little bit. This is not quite linear right it is an exponential function so let's take a look at you know how we feel or what we feel and uh on the surface of the earth as people um and then how do you how do you translate that into aircraft and how do we come up with all of these temperatures and pressures and what are the relationships and how they mean. So to start doing that, here's a picture of the Earth, uh, of a globe. And at the top, we've created a, either a cylinder on the right-hand side or a square. Uh, a square inch is something that we kind of know. It's got, it, Basically, if you put two thumbnails together, it's okay to do that. Put them together and look down. That's about a square inch. So if we look at the top of the atmosphere, beyond that we can assume that it's essentially a vacuum. But as I start going down, if I were to uh, draw a line uh, somewhere in the middle, like right in here, uh, and put my hand there, I would actually feel the weight of the air on my hand. And as I keep going down, that weight gets greater and greater and greater um, until I get to the very bottom of this huge long scale that's 260,000 feet high. If I were to have my thumbs there and measure the weight of all the air that is above, above that in that uh, rectangular prism, that would be 14.7 pounds. 14.7 pounds per square inch. And that's how we get our atmospheric pressure. If you were to translate that into pascals or rather kilopascals it's 101.3 I like to kind of remember that number as just saying it's roughly a hundred thousand pascals or a hundred kilopascals so think about that for a second so that means there's here at the surface of the earth 
at sea level, generally you can think of 14.7 pounds per square inch being exerted on your body, on everything. We don't feel that because we're used to that and we've evolved. So as you get closer to the ground, density of the air is greater because you have all the weight of the air above it pushing down uh, and pressure increases as well. Okay, so it's good to know that uh, as we go down in altitude, if you will, or at the surface of the earth, being sea level, uh, we can measure pressure, we can measure density, and of course we can measure temperature. But it's different all over the, the globe. Uh, temperatures, as you know, weather changes all the time. Temperatures and pressures and densities are all related because we remember from our chemistry class um, about the ideal gas laws. So how do we come up with, how do we use and find temperatures and pressures because they affect air and airplanes fly through air. So we need to develop uh, some sort of standard and aerospace engineers use what's called the standard atmosphere. So standard atmosphere has uh, some very common uh, common things, temperatures and pressures. So at the surface of the earth, you can say it's 15 degrees Celsius or roughly 59 degrees Fahrenheit and 14.7 PSI. As you go up in altitude, temperature is fairly linear and pressure, again, back from the uh, that previous graph, pressure decreases exponentially. So here's kind of an interesting graph that shows what happens with temperature uh, and pressure. So the top curve shows you what happens right here at the surface of the earth. And when you go from sea level up to 10,000 feet, how it, temperature gradually changes about two degrees Celsius per thousand feet. So you can see the temperature gradient from sea level to 10,000 feet is basically 20 degrees. Similarly, if you can look at pressure, which here is uh, inches of mercury, it's not, it's a different unit rather than kilopascals, but it's a way that weather people, if you watch a, a weather report, you're going to see atmospheric pressure and in inches of mercury. So you can see how that goes down as well. So let's look then and develop some equations that we can use. So we said that airplanes mostly travel in the troposphere. So we're going to assume that. So I took uh, a snapshot of the troposphere and let's look at the temperature first. And let's not consider the tropopause where it goes up, but let's consider that linear slope. If we look at that, we can develop this equation that says temperature uh, is a linear function and H here is height in meters temperature is in degrees Celsius. So the top equation should look pretty familiar to us. From math, we know that there's a form of equation called point slope form that says y equals mx plus b. That's what this temperature equation is in the form of. And we look at pressure. Pressure is a little bit different. It is an exponential. But both temperature and pressure just have one input. So in temperature, you just need to know your altitude H in meters, calculate your temperature, and then you put your temperature into your pressure equation. Um, so note that there are some constants here. Uh, 273.1 gives you, uh, that's the difference between your temperature and uh, absolute zero. So these are the equations that we would use to find temperature and pressure with our known altitude.
but perhaps even more important than temperature and pressure, um, depending on what you're calculating. Density. Density is very important. So we remember from chemistry, from our ideal gas laws, that PV equals MRT. It's a slightly different form of the equation you might remember, which said PV equals N instead of M. RT. Um, and this one is perfectly valid. It's just R is a little bit different for each gas. But if you rearrange that equation, you can get, if you get M, which is mass, divided, divided by volume, that's not velocity there, that's density. And you solve for that and you plug in some constants, you can finally solve for density and come up with an equation. So Obviously, this has a pressure in it that we need to know and a temperature. So our first step is to go back to our temperature equation, plug in our altitude to get temperature, plug in our temperature to get pressure, and then we can figure out density. So density in this case, this is using the SI system or the metric system. Density is in kilograms per cubic meter. Well, we want to know all these things and be able to model all these things because each aircraft has a different mission and we want to know what's going to happen at certain altitudes or at least be able to model it so that we can be safe as pilots and passengers. So, for example, you've heard of people, of course, climbing Mount Everest. It's 29,000 feet tall and that's the altitude where a lot of jet craft jet aircraft actually fly. So if you're flying from where we live here in the Chicago area to Grandpa and Grandma's house, maybe that's in California or wherever, you're probably flying right near 30,000 feet. Maybe it's 35,000, maybe it's a little less, but generally you're in that area, in that neighborhood. If you're climbing Mount Everest, you have to stop and wait several days for and wait for your body to acclimate to those conditions. Well, if you're in a jet aircraft, you don't have several days. You have a few minutes. So we need to understand what's happening at those levels. Usually you're going to pressurize the airplane and provide some oxygen. And if you don't do that, uh, and if you don't do it properly, your aircraft can actually fail. So let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk a little bit more about speed. Uh, and this relates to commercial aircraft uh, and military aircraft. Here you see uh, a military aircraft breaking the speed of sound or breaking the sound barrier and you see a visible representation of a shockwave. So let's take a look a little bit at how those are formed. So we're all familiar with trains and train horns and so on. Uh, you've probably heard of the Doppler effect. And what happens to a, a moving object, this is a pretty good representation. This train is moving forward, and whether it's the train itself or the horn, when it the horn blows, it only moves, that sound is a pressure wave, so it moves at the speed of sound through air. Because the train is moving forward from left to right, those waves are pretty close together as opposed to in the back of the train they're farther apart that's because the train is moving if the train moves fast enough all of these waves come together to create a shock wave it's really high pressure um, there's a different set of equations for anything that's moving above about 250 miles an hour We'll talk about Mach numbers here in a little bit. That's about Mach 0.3. So let's take a look at, you know, how does that affect aircraft? So aircraft and drag increases as your speed increases. We're going to talk about that uh, in an upcoming video. So one thing to know is that as the Mach number, which is a ratio of the speed of your aircraft to the speed of sound as that gets to be close to one or as you get close to the sound barrier that's where you're going to have a lot of drag you can see here a pretty cool picture of an aircraft uh, this is actually in a in a wind tunnel but all these little yellow lines are 
shockwaves and you can see how it's coming off the wings here that's why you have swept wings instead of straight wings that's why it was so hard originally for aerospace engineers to break the sound barrier we didn't understand that Right, so let's take a closer look at Mach number. I mentioned that on the last slide. So the Mach number is the airspeed over the speed of sound at that altitude, and it changes with altitude. So at sea level, it is about 761 miles per hour. That again, that's assuming the standard atmosphere model, or about 1200 kilometers per hour. Um, and it is only relative to temperature. It is directly related to temperature. So let's look at some, some definitions on uh, relationship to the sound barrier. So Mach 1 is a sound barrier. Below that is called subsonic flow. Between Mach 1 and Mach 5, that's called supersonic. Above that is called hypersonic and then high hypersonic. Uh, that that is going really really fast I mentioned that sound the speed of sound the local speed of sound changes with temperature uh, there's an equation we can derive which I won't hear but as temperature changes so does your speed of sound so as the temperature decreases as it does in the altitude as we go higher the speed of sound also decreases that's something very very important that plays a role in how we design aircraft